welcome everyone. Um, as most of you know, I'm uh, Antioch University Chancellor Bill Groves, and I could not be more honored to be an Antiochian than tonight as we learn about how Antiochians have been winning victories for humanity by fighting for the right to vote, fighting against voter suppression, fighting for an inclusive democracy, and doing all of that over four decades, more than that, six decades. So before sharing uh, more about tonight's uh, panel discussion, let me open with a little commercial about the Antioch Works for Democracy events. This has been a multi-month, multi-pronged campaign of education and action to strengthen an inclusive and robust democracy in America. Over the past months, we've done voter registration. We brought in keynote speakers, hosted numerous panel discussions, book reading and book club kind of conversations, engaged in community engagement of all sorts and community, or excuse me, employee days of actions. Um, all of these activities have been open to our Coalition for the Common Good colleague at Otterbein University. And tonight um, we invited our colleagues at Antioch College. So we may have some participants from the college. All of you, uh, just again, welcome and thank you for coming. About tonight, um, Rarely am I at a loss for words, but tonight might be one of those times. The three individuals I have the honor to introduce tonight have devoted their lifetimes to building an inclusive and just society. They have fought against voter suppression and they've worked tirelessly to ensure voting rights of African-Americans, of youth and others um, all over the last six decades. It is this important pre-election roundtable um, that we are going to have three panelists with these deep roots and struggling for voters' rights and civil rights to share reflections on that important history and explore the lessons for today's critical election. And in that, our Antioch connections run deep. So let me start with some introductions and begin with David Goodman. David is a 1969 graduate of Antioch College. He is the brother of Andrew Goodman, the young civil rights activist murdered in 1964, during the historic voter registration drive in the Deep South, known as Freedom Summer. The Andrew Goodman Foundation was founded a couple of years later in 1966 and has been working to uplift the voices of youth in our democracy for decades. I also want to share that David was on the board of Antioch College for many years, and it was there that I first met him probably 15, 17 years ago. Judy Richardson is a 1978 graduate of Antioch, Baltimore. She's not only a well-known documentary filmmaker, including Eyes on the Prize, America's Civil Rights Movement, but she's also a founding staff member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, known as SNCC, back in the 1960s. Judy is a lifelong fighter for social justice through her teaching, writing, documentaries, and activism. And finally, and not least, uh, Dr. Janet Dewart Bell, a double Antiochian. As a 1974 alum of Antioch, Baltimore, and more than some 45 years later, a 2010 alum of Antioch's PhD in Leadership and Change Program. Janet is also an author, speaker, teacher, and president of LEAD Intergenerational Solutions, and may I add, Janet is a member of the Antioch University Board of Governors to this day. And I want to thank Janet for helping to make this Antioch Works for Democracy series what it is. She contributed heavily in this project. So thank you, Janet. I know tonight's panel will make you all proud to walk in their steps, to hear their activism and work over the last decades. The first part of this will be a discussion, will be facilitated by Janet. Um, you can post any questions you might have as we move along here tonight in the Q&A. And as time permits, we will get to those questions and answer as many as possible. So now with that, welcome everyone. And let me turn the microphone over to Janet Dewart bell Thank you, Janet. Yes, thank you very much, Bill Gross, Chancellor. I'm so pleased to be able to uh, have this conversation uh, with my wonderful university, Antioch University, and on behalf of the university, the college, and Audubon. This is 
a moment where one can only think about what the title says, winning victories for humanity. And as our founder says, be ashamed to die and to have won a victory for humanity, uh, Horace Mann. So we, we are doing that. And it, even though it's talking about history and legacy, it's very much focused on the present and the future. And the two people we have today really are uh, awe-inspiring who have kept the faith, who've moved along the the arc of justice in the universe, and who continue to work very hard to this day. What we will do is that we'll have a presentation of each of them. Judy Richardson will start. She will give a little bit about her background and talk about how she came to the work. After she does that, then David Goodman will do the same. And then we will have a moderated conversation among the three of us. And I am just pleased to do this. So I'll let me turn the microphone over to Judy Richardson, who has done a lot, including uh, was the co-founder of Drum and Spear Bookstore, which at that time was the largest, I think, Black mm -hmm. bookstore in, in the country, among many things. She is also working on several documentaries for museums. And she's very involved, of course, with the SNCC Legacy Project, but she will tell you more about that. Thank you, Judy, for participating in this conversation. Oh, thank you, Janet. I mean, I'm just delighted to be with you all um, and, and talking about the movement, particularly now when everything is in such perilous condition. So um, first, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how I get into SNCC and then what SNCC is, because not a, a lot of people don't know what SNCC was. So um, First of all, that my involvement at SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, it changed the entire direction of my life, right? It changed how I saw my world, um, what I wanted to do with my life. Um, it exposed me to people and to concepts that have just influenced me the rest of my life, right? And, um, and at that point, I was 19 years old. Now, much of the work that I was doing at SNCC and, and in some ways that I continue to do um, has involved empowering is has involved empowering folks who have little to no voice in the society, and the vote has been one of the tools we have used to do that. So first, before I talk about me and SNCC, let me talk about what SNCC was. SNCC was the only organization in the Southern movement of the 1960s that was founded and led by young people, 18, 19, 20 years old, right? SNCC was founded in April 1960. Now, I was not at that founding conference. I come in at 63, but it was founded in April 1960 by activists from the student sit-in movement, a movement that mushroomed throughout the South after that Greensboro, North Carolina sit-in in February 1960, one month before the SNCC conference that, that gathers all these sit-in leaders together. And the movement was grounded in the activism of Black students at HBCUs. Now, these students were then brought together by the legendary strategist and organizer, um, Ella Baker. And if you could just put up number one uh, photo, that's Ms. Baker. Um, and uh, that first organizing, that's Ms. Baker. Um, the first organizing meeting was done at her alma mater, the HBCU Shaw University. And in fact, her photo is also behind me right here. So there, I always have her influence wherever I am. At that first meeting that she called, Ms. Baker cautioned the students to think beyond integration. And I, I should just mention just a thing. Ms. Baker, by the way, was this legendary organizer who had been director of branches for the NAACP. She was uh, in support with, April, um, with um, uh, around the support of the Montgomery Bus Boycott in 55, 56. Um, she's organizing local movement, local NAACP branches as a lone black woman traveling the trains going back and forth between New York City and Florida. And um, she stays with Rosa Parks, for example, during the bus boycott. So Miss Baker um, gives her gives us the, the young people, not only um, her organizing grassroots philosophy, but also her network of organizers, local organizers. In any event, at that first meeting in 1960, she calls all these young students together. So Julian Bond and, and comes in from Atlanta and John Lewis comes in from the Nashville movement. And all these people are coming in. Ruby Doris Robinson comes in from, from uh, the, the, the uh, um, Atlanta student movement. And at that first meeting that she called, Ms. Baker cautioned the students to think beyond integration, 
right? That the struggle had to be bigger than a hamburger. And that's what she says. It's got to be bigger than a hamburger. In other words, she said, you have to deal with whether people can afford the hamburger. Um, and so she's SNCC's mentor. She's grounding the organization in the concept of building bottom-up grassroots leadership, moving away from demonstrations to effective long-term organizing. So SNCC soon becomes an organization of full-time youth organizers. Again, we're 17, 18, 19 years old, right? I think Julian was considered older because he was like 20, you know? Um, and we lived in the communities where we organized, often guided and guarded, guarded by local strong adult leaders. And the primary issues were voting rights. Basically, how do you get black people registered to vote without getting them killed, right? How do you get them, how do you get black people registered to vote without getting them killed? And the second major piece was economic justice. So SNCC was the driving force behind the continuation of the 1961 Freedom Rides through Diane Nash's leadership. She's coming out of the Nashville movement. She's part of that first organizing meeting, as well as 1964 Mississippi Freedom Summer, which included establishment of freedom schools and free health clinics, um, and a voting rights campaign that is propelled by the formation of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, the MFDP. And that's a locally based grassroots organization um, that is at the core of 1964 Freedom Summer. So many remember the speech by the MFDP's Ms. Fannie Lou Hamer, for example, at the Democratic Party convention that year in 1964, where she says, I question America, you know. Now, SNCC chairs have included Marion Barry, who five-time mayor of Washington, DC, John Lewis, we all know John, Stokely Carmichael, issues the cry for black power. And in 1966, um, and other SNCC, um, uh, Stokely and other SNCC organizers, and I'm part of this, go into Lowndes County, Alabama, to organize an independent black political party with the Black Panther as its logo. And it had that logo because the Alabama, the state Alabama Democratic Party, the official Democratic Party of Alabama had as its logo, a white rooster with the words white supremacy for the right emblazoned on its logo. So when the when we proposed a logo for the folks in Lowndes County and, and that logo is, is, is the Panther, um, the folks in Lowndes County say, oh yeah, we got, we like the Panther, you know, cause a Panther can beat a rooster any day in the week, right? So um, uh, Stokely is selected SNCC chair in 66. And that, that cry for black power, that demand for black power is a slogan that is reflected. It was, re it was reflecting a, a concept that had long grounded SNCC's organizing. Um, SNCC was always guided by the concepts Ms. Baker spoke about at a 1964 Mississippi meeting. And she said, quote, even if segregation is gone, we will still have to see that everyone has a job. And it's important to understand, she's saying everyone, not just black people, not just brown people, everyone, poor white people, everyone has got to have a job. She says, even if we can all vote, but if people are still hungry, we, we the larger, we will not be free. Singing alone, she says, is not enough. We need schools and we need learning. And that's what Ms. Baker's saying in 64. Um, so how do I get into SNCC? And I'm gonna make this very uh, quick. Um, if you can go to number two, um, you will see me. Now I'm the middle one kind of with the clipboard and staring vacantly into space just before we all got arrested. I was born in Tarrytown, New York, 45 miles north of New York City. Um, Tarrytown for then for, for me then was was it's a, it was a factory town. Now other people knew it as a suburb, um, but all the black people I knew, all the poor white people, Italians, Irish, um, uh, Polish, they all worked where my father worked, which was the plant, and that was the Chevrolet plant that um, it made parts for the Chevrolet cars. Um, and my father helped organize the United Auto Workers local there, and he was treasurer of that local when he had a heart attack and died on the line, on the assembly line when I was seven. My mother becomes a single parent. She uh, had an eighth grade education, but read everything. We're looking at Meet the Press. She's looking at the New York Post when it was still a newspaper, all that. 
and she played a mean jazz piano. So she gets my sister and me um, to college. Fast forward, I'm now on a full four-year scholarship at Swarthmore College, the Quaker College in Pennsylvania. And I find that there is an SDS chapter on campus. Now SDS, for many of you may know this, but SDS was the Students for a Democratic Society, the national organization of progressive, primarily white college students who very much supported the 1960 burgeoning student movement coming out of these black campuses, very much supportive of SNCC. So I find out that this SDS chapter is um, organizing busloads of students to go down on weekends to help desegregate public facilities in Cambridge, Maryland on the Eastern shore of Maryland. Now in Cambridge, black folks had had the vote for years, right? But they had no real power and they couldn't sit down at white restaurants or use the roller rink, the, the skating rink. And that made the young black people really upset. And it's they who say, we're not gonna take this anymore. And they young people get their parents and the adults involved. And the adults say, we need some help organizing these people. They come to SNCC. So, um, but I didn't know all that. At this point, I'm just going to my first meeting of this SDS chapter on Swarthmore's campus, right? I have no major commitment to any struggle. It's just that my mother's not there to stop me. And I'm trying to figure out what is this all about? Let me see what this is going on, right? And I end up joining a busload of students headed to Cambridge, Maryland to join the protests. So I find that the Cambridge movement, it was called CNAC, the Cambridge Nonviolent Action Committee. Um, it was group centered. They decided everything by consensus. They were an affiliate of SNCC, but the leader who was out front and spoke to the media was Gloria Richardson. And I think she's number three. If you could pull a Gloria up. Um, she was a graduate of Howard University. And as you can see, um, Gloria, for her, um, nonviolence was a tactic only, right? Um, she always told people, look, once I'm off the, the, the picket line, all bets are off, right? Okay. So um, on the demos, I would sometimes get arrested. I started being in jail more on the weekends than on Swarthmore's campus. Sometimes that spilled over to Mondays. So it was suggested that I take off a semester and go into um, uh, and, and just for six months. And um, I do that. We can talk about my mother's reaction when I mentioned to her. But I say to her, the four-year full scholarship, it's intact. They have guaranteed it. I've talked to the provost. Um, and it's only going to be six months. Now, it turns out to be three years, but who knew, right? So one day, after working a while in the Cambridge movement, Reggie Robinson, the SNCC organizer who was um, early on, uh, kind of legendary SNCC organizer, came out of Baltimore. And he was he was the SNCC organizer in Cambridge. And he says, look, I'm going down to the national office. Come go with me and we'll come on back. I said, fine, right? So um, I go in and I'm thinking, whoa, national office, this is amazing, right? This is going to be like the Urban League, right? It's going to have rugs on the floor. Or, you know, we're going to ritzy. Okay, so we go off and um, it was a little side street that you went off onto, um, right near the Atlanta University Center with Spelman and Morehouse and Clark Atlanta and the, the HBCUs in Atlanta. And um, we started this little small place near a, a, a barber shop. Um, and there's a, a plate glass window. And Reggie opens the door and there's this big man um, sweeping the stairs. And Reggie looks so happy to see him, right? And he hollers up and they hug like they're long lost brothers. And I'm thinking, boy, this is an egalitarian place, boy. This snick is egalitarian because Reggie must be hugging the janitor. But then he calls the man's name and it turns out it's Jim Foreman. And I realize, oh my gosh, this is Jim Foreman, this, this SNCC's larger than life executive secretary. He's the head of SNCC, right? And um, it turned out that Foreman often swept the stairs, even though he wasn't that good at it, but, but he was saying... He was giving two messages to everybody who saw him doing this, which was all the staff and the staff in the national office. Um, and that was no job is too lowly for anyone in SNCC to do. And every job is important to sustaining the organization. And if you can pull up number four, I think that's the singing in the local um, singing. Yeah, that's us. Okay. You can see who's um, in this photo. Um, 
you would see, for example, um, you'll see I'm, I'm the one clapping my hands. Okay, to camera left, to the left of me, you would see Foreman with his head kind of down a little bit. You would see next to him with the, the trench coat on, that's Marion Barry, five-time mayor of Washington, D.C. You would see Lawrence Gee, Gee out right above my head there. You would see to my right, John Lewis. You would see way to the right, um, Julian Bond, cigarette hanging out his mouth. So these are the folks that I find when I get there. And I find this whole organization of young people running this. There's a Watts line, there's a Friends of SNCC, there's a Prince Sharp, there's a research department. Um, and so this is the community that I come into and it is the same community and, and they're calling the field. I mean, at this point, SNCC had um, field offices in Mississippi, Alabama, Southwest Georgia and Arkansas. And they're all working with local grassroots leadership primarily around the vote. And so when I come into SNCC, I think I've, you know, died and gone to heaven. And which is why the six months becomes, you know, three years. But now we have the SNCC Legacy Project and I won't go into what we're doing, but the same group that I'm, I was surrounded by there, they are still moving and we're still doing all this stuff. So let me, let me end there. Yeah. Thank you. That is fascinating. And uh, really we, I could listen forever. I, I wish we had more time. And, and there are a couple of things I wanted to point out of, of what you said, and that's the youth-led uh, leadership. And and one thing that you did not dwell on, because you, you don't ever dwell on it, to my knowledge, are the dangers that you and others faced going down south. When you talk about even uh, Miss Baker going to Florida and things like that, these were not easy and safe trips. So I want us to keep that in mind about what the times were. So thank you, Judy. David Goodman, um, I know that when you came to Antioch College, it was at a very difficult time. And will you tell us about that and tell us a little bit about um, your background and how you've gotten involved and continue to stay involved in the civil rights, the freedom movement? So first of all, I'd like to uh, say, Janet, how appreciative I am to be invited here today and to be on the same platform with you and you, Judy, who uh, are icons for me and many people in the social justice uh, arena. Um, you can hear me okay? Yes. Perfectly. Okay, great. Uh, the the all of our stories are so interesting in a way uh my story and my brother's story our family story starts in 1846 mm. i said 1846 i was born in 1946 so i'm still ancient but that's even more ancient that was the birthday of my great grandfather i don't quite remember when my great grandmother was born that her name was sarah goodman wolf goodman and they were born in what was called the Pale of Settlement, which was the Western extreme border of the Russian Empire. And uh, at that time, certainly uh, after the mid 1800s into uh, 18, during our Civil War, for example, uh, for a Jew to uh, Jews to live, we're only allowed to live in in this area, uh, which is if you draw a line from um, Lithuania down through what's Belarus now into Odessa, uh, Ukraine, of all places. Uh, Jews were allowed to live there. The Russian emperor, uh, czar said so. But they weren't, they weren't considered people, much like uh, there were thousands, tens of thousands of lynchings between Reconstruction and 1965, 64, and to some extent still continue. Um, the number of Jews murdered or assassinated or lynched for the same kind of reasons as in this country, uh, why white people lynch black people was, is a long documented story, but, um, my grandfather figured, okay, my great grandfather, I'm getting out of here. So he came to this country and I, did not know much about this story. I'm not a historian, I'm a civil engineer. And uh, the punchline of this part of my 
uh, sort of now consciousness is that it impacted how our family saw things, let's put it like that, or felt things or imagined things, that uh, life is tenuous unless you fight for the right to live. And nobody's given you anything in so many uh, historical contexts. And today, you live in Gaza, or you live in Israel, or you live in Ukraine, uh, life is a, a big question. Something can come out of the sky and blow you up. Uh, that's that's what uh, I came to understand is a part of a Homo sapiens history from the recording time. Uh, and it certainly was for our family. So um, I grew up until I was 17. So my brother was three years older than me, Andrew Goodman. And until I was 17, I believed, um, simplistically speaking, that all people are created equal. I, I just took it. I never questioned it. No one told me to, and I didn't know any better. And it took me decades to comprehend what that clause meant, which was written by a young, talking about young people, 33-year-old guy, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, there was no Rosetta Stone embedded in that I could see in the Declaration of Independence. So there was no, you know, context or footnotes and no one told me about it. And uh, I'm still learning about it. So my brother's murdered along with James Cheney and Michael Schwerner. And uh, I had no clue why that would happen. Why would good, God-fearing Christian men murder three innocent kids? Now we're just trying to uphold our democracy. And it made no sense to me. It's kind of like, it makes no effing sense to me why someone would vote for Donald Trump. I mean, I can tell an intellectual just explanation for why, but I mean, I just don't understand it. And I don't understand how people who go to church uh, and learn, thou shall not kill for 18 grown men to murder three innocent guys who just want to vote. Now I'm, I'm putting it obviously in simplistic terms, but here I am a white kid. I, I come from fortunate circumstances, uh, but I heard a lot about what went on in the world, except nobody really explained to me what racism was. Nobody explained to me, um, Another man was lynched today, you know, the flag that hung outside of the NAAC's office. I never saw that. I didn't understand what slavery was, really. Uh, it, it, uh, it was terrible and bad, but I, I didn't really get that it was a business proposition. Really, just business. And I went to the Stanford Business School and None of my friends who were, there were 300 kids in the class. I think there were four African-Americans and five women. This was 1969. This is after I got out of Antioch. I got sprung out of Antioch and went right in. And all of the things that I learned were kind of interesting, but didn't really tell me anything about what's really going on in the world. So... Uh, I learned about this in a way I wouldn't wish on anybody, and I'm still learning. And it seemed to me that as a business, I was, I was particularly interested in business, what you call business economics, or the economics of sort of macro business economics, uh, that the more suppression there is of minority groups, uh, and Jewish groups, the more anti-Semitism, the more racism, the more isms and homophobia and poor treatment of women, the worse the economy does. Now, I'm, I'm looking at this in kind of uh, cold steel angles from every, like life is like a hologram. You got to look at it from every angle, or I do. And um, I looked at the economic uh, growth of the country in, in segments in terms of uh, the former Confederate states, the Northeastern states, the Western states, and the I was stunned, and still am, that the most backward states economically 
are Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, all the states where uh, the, the, the view of marginalizing groups of people, whether it's black, white, or uh, anti-Semitism, which I just got to tell you this real fast, but I will I'll put it off for a second, put it in the parking lot, that all of these are bad for people's well-being, national security, and economic well-being. Uh, you, you said uh, that everybody has to have a job for everybody to do well. And right now we have the highest employment and deployment in almost in our nation's history and the economy is doing really well because of it whether it's black people white people jewish people christian people yet the concept of better than or them and us destroys our economic opportunity um there's a fantastic book written by bishop barber uh, reverend barber william barber called White Poverty. And he talks about how the poverty in this country is majority white, poor people, in, in terms of statistics, not percentage of the identity group's population. And it just struck me that this is bad, that racism, that hatred, that anti-Semitism, which... I'm more attuned to maybe than non-Jews is bad for our country in every single respect. It's bad economically. And I talk about this because a lot of people can relate to what's in my pocket and how, how am I getting a good job? Where are the good jobs? And of course, um, these fascists who, one of whom is from the great state of Ohio, which I happen to love the state of Ohio, says Haitians are eating white people's dogs and cats is another example of such a big lie. It's just unimaginable. And you say, how can anyone believe it? Yet they do. So all of these things stitched together in a mosaic that I would say, that just to, to name it, is half the voting population and the other half doesn't agree with that viewpoint. And um, this is sort of like the Civil War, as in the shooting, killing Civil War, where you had the slave enslavers, okay, in one place, and you had the abolitionists in one in the other place. And uh, the descendants of the enslavers and the abolitionists still fighting the same war. And by the way, what I've read in, in the history books, and again, I'm no historian, it seemed to me as I metabolize my personal experience that the structure that allowed a relatively small group of white male heterosexual privileged people to run the country, which is still the case, 1% uh, of the population owns 33% of the assets. 1%. The next 9% own the next 33% of the assets. That's 10% owning 7 out of 10 of the assets of this country. And the 90% get very little. And it's the structure that started before Thomas Jefferson was born. Yeah. And it's ingrained now. So this is how I said, this just seems really dumb. Okay. And Besides being unfair. And that's how I got involved in saying we can do this better. Yes, and I just want to point out two things. One, I think you you came to Antioch the year that your brother was assassinated. Is that correct? And at the college, or at least at that time. And then also you and your family with your mother, Carolyn, have really um, not only done the legacy, but have done a lot of work for voting rights, which we'll get into in just, in just a moment. Yeah, so... My brother was murdered on June 21st, 1964, along with Cheney and Schwerner. Uh, they were actually not after my brother. They didn't even know who he was. He was a volunteer in SNCC. Judy was one of the people running it. My brother was just a volunteer. He was kind of like one of a thousand. And uh, they were being trained in Ohio, of all places. 
a thousand students from all over the Northeast. And uh, Cheney and Schwerner had been down in Mississippi as organizers and were up there for the training. And a church got burned down where they were trying to put together a, free, a school, a freedom, one of the many freedom schools. And they wanted to volunteer to drive with them down to Mississippi. This is on Friday, June 19th, 1964. And there was a coin flip because a lot of the volunteers wanted to go and my brother won the coin flip. Mm. Uh, anyway, At he was um, apprehended. They were stopped for uh, so-called speeding. They actually weren't moving. It was a very slow, high-speed situation. And they got put in jail. And then the sheriff, who had been tipped off about their presence in Philadelphia, Mississippi, near Meridian, Mississippi, um, let him out in the middle of the night, no phone calls, nothing. And the Klan was ready for him. They nabbed him and killed him. But they buried their bodies in a dam under construction. So nobody knew about it. It took 44 days for the FBI to find them. It's a long story. There's hundreds of books about this. But the, the big picture is that the Ku Klux Klan hated three groups of people. African-Americans and Catholics, white or black. Cheney was a Catholic, black, black Catholic, by the way. And Jews. Now, the Jews were I'm, all communists. Yes. I want I want to we we I, I'm I'm mindful. I want to move oh, yeah. to, to segue into talking about voting rights. So I'm going to turn it back over for a second uh to talk so that Judy can tell us about talk about voting rights and then we'll have and that will lead into our little con our, our conversation that we have. And if we have time at the end, we'll take a couple of questions. Great. And turn audio. Oh, on. I'm sorry. Hey, Before we, I wanted to, I wanted to do one thing. Okay. Um, Harold, if you could show that picture we were trying to show people at the time when they were, were involved, because I want people to know how young people were involved, uh, how young people are involved in the movement at a particular time. If we if we can show that picture of David at age 23, uh, <laughs> we, that would be really great. Uh, and uh as you find that, Judy can also talk to us about our uh, lead off the conversation. Oh, here we go. Okay. A lot of hair there, David. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And okay. so, yes, go ahead, Judy. Let's talk about voting rights and about young people and, and what we need to do. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do is talk about how SNCC gets into, into voting rights. Okay. Um, because... People usually think that it's we in SNCC who decided to focus on voting rights mm -hmm. and voter registration. And in fact, it was the local people um, who we worked with who were already focused on voting rights. Mm -hmm. um, very specifically, Amzie Moore, who was a local NAACP leader in Mississippi. And I remember asking Bob Moses, who was SNCC's Mississippi project director, about Amzie when we were producing that second series, because Eyes on the Prize is 14 hours. And so we were in the middle of producing that second eight hours. And I was dropping Bob off at his home. And I mentioned that I couldn't remember a lot of this history. And then he told me he couldn't either. Um, and then proceeds to tell me the story for the next half hour. Um, so it, it was a story I should mention, by the way, that is also chronicled in the book that um, SNCC's Charlie Cobb wrote. And uh, it was called Radical Equations. And he and Bob wrote this book. And so this story is in it. But Bob said he'd gone to Mississippi in 62 to organize um, a SNCC project there. And he stayed with AMSI. Um, and it was Miss Baker who had told him to check AMSI, that he was the one that that Bob needed to, to talk to. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, you know, this is SNCC's mentor. Um, and so Miss Baker says, okay, if you want to know how to, you know, you want to base voting rights in Mississippi, you need to talk to um, to Amzi. And as a matter of fact, he he's not even thinking about that at that point. He just knows he wants to go to organize in Mississippi. And so, um, and actually he's trying to bring more, more young people to the next conference of SNCC. So it's really, he's not thinking about voting rights at that point. So Bob, um, but Ms. Baker says, you need to go talk to Amzi. Okay, so um, Amzi was part of Ms. Baker's network of all these strong local grassroots leaders. 
And Amzi was a postal worker, was part of her, her network um, that she had developed while she was director of branches for the NAACP and also temporary executive secretary of Dr. King's organization at CLC. So Bob said, look, he said, Bob, he said, Amzi and his wife housed and clothed me for six weeks. And then early on, he said, Amzi takes out a precinct map and spreads it on the kitchen table, looks at Bob and says, look, you young people can do sit-ins if you want to. But I know, says Amzi, that our power as black people will come through organizing around the right to vote. And then he shows Bob the areas in Mississippi where black people were in the majority or had significant populations. And then he says to Bob, look, I'm not ready for you here in Cleveland, Mississippi, in the Delta, meaning I don't yet have that local organizing, uh, local organization that you can build on. But C.C. Bryant has it, he's ready for you in Macomb in Southwest Mississippi. And that becomes SNCC's first voter registration project in Mississippi. Now, how did Amzie know about C.C. Bryant, who was a barber in Macomb? Because they were both leaders in the Regional Council of Negro Leadership, the RCNL, which was founded by Black Mississippi doctor T.R.M. Howard um, and composed mainly of returning Black veterans coming back from World War II including folks like Amzie Moore and Ed, uh, Medgar Evers and many others. And by the way, one of the many films I'm doing with our, my old film company, um, uh, Northern Light Project Productions, is an exhibit on um, black, black uh, not soldiers, because there are a lot of other, uh, but, but black um, folks in um, World War, during World War II. And so we just sent out the almost fine cut on that and we're doing, that's anyway. So I was able to get in RCNL and AMSI and Megger in that film. Um, so in and fact, the RCNL held a meeting of 10,000 black people in the all black town of Mambayu where TMR, TRM Howard was the doctor. And to talk about organizing, this is 52, right? 1952, talk about organizing against local segregated white businesses, against the racist policies of the US Department of Agriculture, in terms of giving out loan guarantees to farmers and whatever, against racist violence from law enforcement and organizing even then for voter registration. Yes, I, want, I wanted to say, uh, point out two things that you mentioned about how black veterans came back after fighting for this country abroad, how many people such as Medgar Evers really were involved in uh, the voting rights uh, and uh, the freedom struggle for Black people here as well. I wanted to sort of move the conversation along a little bit. And okay, could I do just, can I say oh, just one thing? Because there's a wonderful can. quote that I really think um, people need to hear is from Bob, and it has to do with these local organizers. Bob Moses. Bob Moses. Yes. SNCC's project director in Mississippi. And he said, there was a joining of a young generation of people with an older generation that nurtured and sustained them. He said, we could go any place in Mississippi and down some road, there was family and we could show up there unannounced with no money and no nothing. And someone was gonna let me in, give me a bed to sleep, sleep in, feed me and watch my back. They were gonna sit up at night with, a sh with the shotguns across their knees and make sure that we were protected. Those were the first folks who grounded us, those local local movement organizers. That, that was it. Thank you for sharing that. That's, that is very important and a, and a great quote. Um, so tell us, so I'm going to ask both of you this question. What, so fast, fast forward, we have, there's so much to discuss. I mean, that's why you have a whole legacy project, right? <laughs> and why there's an Andrew Goodman Foundation. But but David, can you tell us a little bit what the Andrew Goodman Foundation has been doing in terms of democracy issues and voting rights? We took a page out of SNCC's book, which was highly uh, documented. Uh, and the mission of the Andrew Goodman Foundation is making young voices and votes a powerful force in democracy. And we're back to the future. And we have been for a long time, although... Most Americans don't know that, or many of them don't care, uh, it seems. But the uh, change in demographics since I was born, since we were born, uh, I, I can't tell how old you are, Janet, but- I'm your, I'm your same age. We're both 78. 
Oh, but you don't look it and I do. So anyway, um, the demographic in 1946 was about 90% uh, Caucasian in this country. And now if you're under eight years old, it's uh, what we would say minority majority. And this is scaring the white power structure because there's no way you can win a fair vote uh, if uh, the white power structure is still foundationally racist, they'll be outvoted. But the voter suppression today, and there's 10, 20 chapters of how to do that, is so incredible that if you're not embedded in how voter suppression works, it's not credible. No one would believe you. Um, and that's a long story. And uh, it'll take hours to share it. But basically, the playbook is take the youngest voters who are now, if you take 18 to 29 year olds, I'll call them freshman voters, are the least likely demographic to vote, and they're most diverse. So two reasons not to want them to vote if you are a power structure that's reflecting old fashioned views that are go way back 400 years. And the Andrew Goodman Foundation organizes students at about between 70 and 100 colleges, uh, depending on which year it is, to very register diverse their peers group of to vote. Organizers. Yeah, and um, they have the simplistic job, it's not so simple, of registering their peers to vote and getting them out to vote. Now, in that process, they uncover the barriers to not just registering, which is step one, but step two, to uh, suppress the vote of the, this demographic, which is 20 million people in colleges and 40 million in population for that age cohort to keep them from voting. And uh, that's a long story. We've all heard about it, but the granularity is stunning and it's very effective. So and we're we're working to uh, make it more democratic. If you want to read an incredible book, by the way, that just came out, it's anti-democratic. Inside the far right's 50-year plot to control America's elections. It's and it's a long story. I'm not going to go over it anymore, but that's what we're working against, all of us. But I wanted to say what part of the process of what the foundation does in terms of training young people to register other young people to vote is that I assume it's still the case where you where you give stipends so people are not limited by their their um by their own personal circumstances, because we all know we didn't get reparations and there's very little intergenerational wealth. So in order to have a diverse group working on these issues, you really have to reach out and, and understand that the people need to be paid for for their work. So I think that that's a very um, right. wonderful. Well, we, we didn't start out with that. We were show you how ignorant I was. But, um, you, but what we learned. We the figured it out. Uh, the and kids came that information. The kids came out to us and said, oh, this is a great plan. We organize, we educate them about SNCC and what happened 60 years ago, or it was 50 years ago. And uh, so organize them, educate them, organize them, and then advocate for equal access to the ballot box. And when necessary, litigate. We, we don't, we're not lawyers, we're plaintiffs. And the, the, the students at various schools have been plaintiffs with us. So they learn how to do all this. And uh, they said, you know what? Uh, we don't have any money. And we said, well, we're a foundation. We'll give you a stipend. That's what you were saying. And it was an economic justice issue. The, the, the program, sort of soup to nuts, is uh, conscious of the otherwise structures that we have in this country. And I, I, th I think you've raised a, a lot of issues there in terms of economic justice and what have you. We only have a few more minutes. So what I'd like to do is to ask two of you if you have, I mean, these are these are very deep issues and we can talk about it. But in terms of voting rights, um, we've, we've hinted at that. But what people would like to know, I think, is what keeps you motivated? Why do you keep going? And what is your hope for the future? So give us the words of wisdom that you would like to uh, you you would like to share. So I'm going to start with you, Judy. First of all, I would I put in the chat um, the 
the the pro the NEH project that we're working on um, because uh, I just came back yesterday from uh, Atlanta Civil Rights Museum. We're working with six um, black history museums like Atlanta, Birmingham, um, the Blacksonian here, the Smithsonian here, um, and uh, also six HBCUs around six organizing themes. So we have a number of, all of these are free downloads, SNCC organizing tradition. We're just doing the last one we did, which we did at in Atlanta was on voting rights all of them free downloads. So you can get those free downloads at that link. Uh, they're all based on primary documents, oral histories, because a number, since 2014, when we were first founded as SNCC Legacy Project, we have done a number of things with the larger um, uh, movement for black lives. Um, so we, are, we do a lot of conferences and work with them. We're doing working with them on archiving, but this NEH one is around, um, uh, and then I'm going to, give you the parting word, um, is is around um, the, the this NEH project. And so that will show you that in the, the very next time you will be able to log on, not log on, it's both virtual and stream, uh, virtual and in person, will be at Morehouse. And November 15th and 16th will be at Nor Morehouse. Um, and then um, working with educators around the toolkits. So you asked how I keep going. Part of it is that I love to dance. And so um, if Tito Puente comes on or Fania Oral Stars, I get up. I've been known to get up out my bed when Fania Oral Stars come on with Tito Puente and start to do a salsa. Okay. Um, or Marvin Gaye, could be anything. So the music keeps me. But the other thing is that I surround myself with people who really do think you really can change stuff. I mean, the head of the, the, the chairman of SNCC is Cortland Cox. I'm 80, he's 83. Um, Dottie Zellner, who's in Jew, Jew, uh, Jewish Voice for Peace. She is about, and I'm about to see her in two days because we're gonna, gonna hang out here in Baltimore. Um, she uh, is about to be 86. Wow. Um, none of us have stopped. You know, the women, people say, well, haven't you retired? No, nobody retired. Um, I'm working on five films. But the other thing is that, um, <laughs> you know, none of us are sitting here, you know, rocking, making baby booties, you know, maybe doing that too. But definitely we are also doing this social activism and we have continued to surround ourselves with people who really do think that if you do certain things, things will change. They may not change overnight. It may be what, you know, what a lot of the older people said to us. We may not see the change that we're working for, but if you do nothing, nothing changes, right? So some of them were, were figuring they would never see black people vote, but again, they had to do something because otherwise they're, the folks coming behind them would have to go through the same stuff. That's what they were trying to do. Okay, so, but Ms. Baker, and I'll leave you with these words. Ms. Baker, she says, I'm part of the human family. What the human family will accomplish, I can't control. But somewhere down the line, the numbers increase. The tribe increases. So she says, how do I keep on? She said, I can't help it. I believe that the struggle is eternal. Somebody else carries on. And it's the young people and the people I surround myself with who keep me going. Okay. And I have oh. lots of hope. And okay. we're going to get this man. He is not coming back into the White House. Okay. <laughs> David, you have one minute. You got to get back up when you get knocked down. It's just instinct, if, if you got the right instincts. And it, it's not a matter of logic. It's you got to keep going. It it's almost sounds Pollyannish in a way. But I got to tell you that John Lewis kind of fixed in my mind the model, which is he got whacked over the head over and over and over again. There's no reason why he lived through that stuff, but he did. And he said he just got up and he kept going because he believed that democracy should work. As simplistic as that sounds, that ain't the case. So you got to make it. it. The law ain't the law until you make it the law. I mean, uh, et cetera. And democracy is an is a ideal, a, a notion. And um, it's not in the real world. We got to make it in the real world. And that's the only way that it's going to work. Thank you. David Goodman and Judy Richardson for continuing to win victories for humanity. Mm -hmm.